On November 19, 2023, the Galaxy Leader, a car carrier vessel operated by Japanese company NYK, was hijacked in the Red Sea. The attack was perpetrated by the Houthi, a political and military organization from Yemen. The ship was taken along with its crew of 17 Filipinos, two Bulgarians, three Ukrainians, two Mexicans, and one Romanian. It's been more than 150 days since the hijacking, and it seems that there has been barely any update about this issue. So where is the ship now? And has the crew been sent home? A few months ago, I saw a video update about this incident, and apparently the ship has been turned into a local tourist attraction. People were being ferried over to the ship for selfies and videos. I mean, as long as the crew is not being harmed and they are being treated humanely, I don't see any problem with that during the course of the negotiations. However, it's been almost half a year since the incident. So what's the update now? Apparently, the ship and the crew are still being held hostage. The ship was moved closer to shore, now just about 500 meters from the port city of Hodeida. But hope is fading for their imminent return, as the people in charge of negotiations said they do not expect a release until the war in Gaza is over. It has been reported that their intention is to keep the ship and the crew until the hostilities in Gaza has been ended. But in addition to that, the Houthi potentially also want to be officially recognized as the government of Yemen in exchange for the hostages, which is unlikely to happen, according to one diplomat. So right now, the only point of negotiations at the moment is to ensure humane conditions for the hostages, which at least is being honored. There's no indication of violence against the crew, and some have even reported having gained weight. So at least they're being fed well. Now, I know some of you are going to ask if the crew members are still getting paid their monthly wages in situations like this. Well, yes, of course, they are still getting paid. They should be. Their salaries are sent directly to their family's bank accounts. So it's as if they are still working on board. Plus, with hazard pay. However, as a seafarer myself, I can only imagine how difficult the situation is for those who are being held hostage. I mean, for most of us, the whole reason for working on board a ship is to provide a comfortable life for our family. And ideally, we get to share that comfortable life with them for at least a few months a year. But with this looming uncertainty as to when the conflict will end, the risk of the crew sliding into depression is very high. Back in 2009, at the height of the pirate attacks in Somalia, I worked on board with some crew members who have actually experienced being held hostage. I was with a very big company back then, so ransom was quite easy for them to arrange. It took only about 45 days to get their two ships because two of their ships were captured within the span of one week and their crew to be released. However, one crew member died from a stray bullet during the hijacking, so that had a very big effect on the crew morale. And they were telling me stories that even though they were treated well, they couldn't help but be overwhelmed by hopelessness at the time. And they were there for only 45 days. The galaxy leader has been held for almost half a year. Since late last year, the Houthi have been attacking merchant ships in the Red Sea, which they say is in retaliation against Israel. And this aggression has caused a massive impact on one of the world's busiest trade routes through the Suez Canal, forcing many companies to redirect vessels around Africa, which takes significantly longer and, of course, consumes so much more fuel. Since the beginning of the conflict, there have been around 100 incidents of hostile activity towards merchant vessels in the Red Sea, and more than 20 ships have been physically damaged by missiles or drones, with some injuries to crew members, reported. One bulk carrier ship, the Rubimar, sank after being hit by a missile in late February. On a separate attack, another bulk carrier, the True Confidence, was also hit by a missile which caused a fire to spread on board. 
Two Filipinos and one Vietnamese crew member were killed, and two others were seriously injured, marking the first fatalities since the attacks on merchant ships began in the area. And just a few days ago, a container ship, the MSC Ares, was captured by Iranian forces, although in a different location, but within the same context related to the conflict with Israel. The escalation of the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea, as well as the seizure of the MSC Ares, has significantly endangered the lives of seafarers. They have become collateral in these attacks that they have no direct connection to. Because generally, they don't even know who exactly owns their ships, or who owns the cargo, or who their companies transact with. Now, given that the attacks in the Red Sea are ongoing, why do some companies still order their ships to take that dangerous passage? Well, money, of course. But are the crew members given any choice as to whether or not they want to remain on board a ship if it is scheduled to transit a hazardous or war zone area? Now, this is quite controversial, but technically, yes, they are given a choice. They have the right to refuse. But there's a common belief that if you refuse to join the voyage and ask to go home, there's a very big chance you won't get rehired for another contract in that same company. As seafarers are contractual, as soon as their contract is completed, technically the company no longer holds any obligation for them. And that includes rehiring. In a country like the Philippines, especially if you are in the lower ranks, competition is very fierce. So it's not very easy to look for another shipping company to work for. So although they are given a choice, it might be an offer that they can't refuse. It's different for senior officers like me or a captain. There's no shortage of job offers for our position, so we can afford to be assertive about these things if we want to. Yes, there's hazard pay involved, but not really that much. If you ask me honestly, it's not worth it. It's a few hundred bucks at the most. For the lower ranks, it might not even reach a hundred. Seriously. I was actually working on board a ship a few months ago when these attacks started to happen. And thankfully, the company I worked for immediately issued a statement that their ships will avoid the Red Sea until further notice. That was a good thing. Because... I told the captain that in case our next voyage will take us to that area, I'm not going with them. They'll have to send me home with or without reliever. I believe my exact words were, the ship will not leave port while I'm still on board. Well, we are civilians after all. No weapons on board, no means to defend against missiles. So why should I risk my life just so the company can earn a few more bucks. And for what? A measly hazard pay? The thing is, seafarers put their trust in their manning agencies, sometimes blindly. But the truth is, the company, the ship owners, they can't guarantee your safety once you enter these hazardous areas. They can't guarantee that you will be rescued or that you will be ransomed, especially in this particular situation wherein the perpetrators are not in it for the money. So if they say that they can guarantee your safety, they are lying. So I really have great respect and admiration for those companies, especially the small ones, who took the proactive stance of refusing to pass through the Red Sea until the conflict is resolved. It just shows that they have genuine concern for the safety and welfare of their people, even if it means losing out on a big paycheck. Now, for the companies that still risk sending their ships and their people to danger, well, not so much. Especially since I know just how much, or should I say, just how little compensation they will pay the families of those who died and those who were permanently injured. Sure, it might appear like a big amount at first, but if you compare it to the potential earnings that they could still make for many years, if they were still alive or fit for sea duty, believe me, it's not worth it. But of course, it's up to the individual seafarer if they choose to put themselves in harm's way. You have your reasons, and yeah, I respect that. 
Now, I'm not trying to convince anyone to make the same choices that I would do. I'm just laying the cards down for everyone to see clearly. And from there, maybe you can make your own informed decisions. Besides, what's unacceptable for me might be acceptable for you. It's basically like gambling, and I personally don't gamble. So I'd rather risk not getting rehired by a company that is willing to put their people in danger. At least I'll have a good shot at living a little bit longer. And life is full of possibilities. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.